Steve Coogan, hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going very well. I'm glad. So, your film, Greed. Mm -hmm. You play a British billionaire rich off high street fashion, mm -hmm. subject to a public inquiry. He's a fairly loathsome individual called Sir Richard McCready. That's right. Yeah. Why didn't you just call him Sir Philip Green? Uh, because, um, well, because I'm not the same shape as Sir Philip Green. I can't believe he's still got the Sir, but there you go. Um, I don't look like him, but, th but really, it, in some ways, even though he is, he's not the most charming man on God's green earth, um, it, to single him out would be wrong in a way, because there are many, many uh, more high street retailers who are just as culpable uh, of these, what I think are nefarious practices. Um, uh, it's just that he's the most visible in some ways. I mean, if you, it's a tra I was thinking, how could I pay him a compliment? I suppose he's not um, hiding under a bushel, uh, and he wasn't. He was very upfront about what he did and unapologetic in a way, and in some ways m more honest about these sorts of, you know, I think he, yeah, and, and a lot of these, these other people, what they do is they, they rake in their billions uh, through uh, paying people, you know, minuscule wages and then reaping these huge gargantuan profits for themselves and their shareholders. And uh, they just keep a low profile and uh, hope no one will talk about them. Uh, whereas he has sort of done us all a favour, really, by, by raising it as a spectacle. We'll come on to fast fashion in a little bit more detail later on, but Sorry, I want to focus... Like answering about 10 questions. <laughs> no, no, that. no, it's great. <laughs> um, but I want to talk a little bit more about Sir Philip because I think it's fairly obvious perhaps a character study or you were drawing from him because in the scenes, the public inquiry, you know, there were elements like you were saying, how upfront, unapologetic, bristling he was. Yeah, well, he does point out lo lo lots of people uh, are, uh, avoid tax perfectly legally, but whether it's ethical is, a, is another question. Uh, he points that out and he, he um, uh, he's very upfront about, uh, I mean, we did a lot of the, the lines actually that are uttered in the public inquiry scene are lifted directly from uh, some of the transcripts. Uh, so some of the, some of the lines I say are things that Sir Philip Green did say, mm. um, and uh, so we, we've been fairly careful. There's artistic license, but um, uh, I think we we get away with that because it's sort of humorous. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean he's he uh, uh, he shone a light uh, on on uh, things that, that, you know, raised it as a topic. I'm, I want people to talk about this stuff, and Philip Green has helped in that regard. <laughs> Who do you think are the biggest losers, then, when it comes to fast fashion? Who loses out the most? 75% of the people who are employed uh, in, in manufacturing these clothes in these developing world countries, like uh, Sri Lanka uh, and uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, are women. 75% are women who are paid uh, minuscule wages. If they try to form any kind of representation or unions, they're often knocked back and pay, pay a big price. Um, uh, so, so they're the biggest losers. And in a way, uh, some of the people who buy these clothes or fall into the sort of the, the, this uh, industry that's created, creates a demand by making it sort of uh, socially unacceptable not to be wearing the latest thing for young people so they become literally fashion victims uh, and uh, and so that they're victims in a way too because they're, they're sort of uh, they're complicit in in falling prey to this this uh, d demand that that's uh, manufactured like uh, like like well like people who peddle drugs really they sort of say you know you, you can have these ones cheap and then they sort of reel you into the harder stuff and all that and uh, uh, so I think that's the the uh, uh, the customers, uh, I mean, they, they might get cheap clothes, but uh, in, in the big scheme of things, I don't think they, they I think they're losers too. But by, by far the biggest losers are the, are the, um, are the garment workers in these, these developing, and some of the garment workers in, in Britain too, it's not just in uh, the developing countries. Parts of the film were shot on location in Sri Lanka. Did you meet any of these women who work in these factories? Yes, we did. Uh, I think, and some of them played themselves uh, in the scene, and uh, the people who, who run the garment factories, and these these are these are legal garment factories. These aren't uh, what would be co called sweatshops, uh, which are off the radar. So, uh, so w w the, none, none of the, none of these companies, uh, the, 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 these high street companies, high street fashion uh, retail outlets, uh, are, are doing anything illegal. It's just that they're, they're just um, they need to be put under the microscope. And yes, we met uh, uh, these garment workers, and the scenes in the film where the garment workers show uh, David Mitchell 
uh, where they live, that they're, they're real garment workers and uh, there are refugees, Syrian refugees, who are uh, evicted from uh, the beach because they're spoiling the view uh, for Sir Richard Pacudi's guests, so he, he boots the refugees off the, off the beach. Um, they're real refugees uh, who play themselves and, and uh, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, we met lots of interesting people. It was ironic that we were shooting uh, 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 on the beach uh, with, uh, and in these, these garment factories of people being paid, you know, three, three and a half dollars a day. And then, uh, you know, uh, two weeks before that we were in Monaco on super yachts that cost a hundred thousand pounds a day to rent. Uh, so. It, we saw two different ends of the, of the scale in terms of poverty. I'm sure. There's also the environmental impact, isn't there? Uh, yes, and it's the one thing that gives me hope because, of course, you know, talking about this as an issue is uh, lots of other things are starting to become issues that are talked about. And, it's, and I think we have uh, you know, the younger generation, uh, millennials, to thank for raising issues that wouldn't otherwise have been talked about by uh, the older generation. Uh, that, that is... Uh, gender politics uh, and the environment, principally, and those things are now very firmly uh, are, are out there for discussion. Whether you agree with them or not, they're certainly being discussed. The one thing that isn't really being discussed in all this noise uh, is uh, poverty, is the gap between the rich and the poor. Because uh, uh, when, when um, uh, for one of a better term, millennials and younger people uh, raise the, the, these t topics for everyone to talk about. Um, commerce will encourage it because there's no real threat to them because of course everyone uh, you know because basically gay people have money and uh, transgender people have money so they can still spend money in their shops and um, uh, and environmentally they can they can sort of spin that because you know they can say uh, they can try and wave a flag for what they're doing they can use the environment to try and sell more stuff uh, the one thing they don't really like to talk about is paying people properly, because that affects their bottom line, that affects their shareholders, that affects their, their stock value. Uh, so they don't try to encourage those things. But it is something that needs to be addressed. And if, if it becomes a big enough issue, it will be addressed. I mean, there are things that were never, never talked about in the past, many things to do with sexual politics and to do with the environment were never were, were fringe issues once upon a time. There were just things that people thought hippies or cranks talked about. And now they're mainstream issues. And I'm hoping that uh, the big question that's sort of facing the world, which is the disparity between the super rich and the super poor, is something that people start to talk about. It's Marcuse, I think, repressive desublimation, commodifying ideology that is perhaps challenging or difficult for the established order. I agree with you entirely there. I think that there's, uh, that's how they uh, uh, rob you of power, is uh, instead of, um, it happens all over the world, instead of fighting something, you sort of co-opt it. Uh, you know, it happens, happens in the pharmaceutical industry, I know, uh, people who come up with ideas that might threaten the business model, uh, they don't fight them, they give them a job. <laughs> you touched on wealth inequality. Hmm. Do you think billionaires should exist in our society? Uh, no, I don't. I think, uh, but you know, uh, how you go about stopping that, uh, uh, no I don't. I don't think, I think it's, uh, um, the, the, it's sort of, it's an empirical uh, uh, existence for certain people, and uh, it's it's bad. Uh, I once spoke to uh, a sort of a, a security source uh, who told me that when I was researching the job, was who told me that there were uh, hedge funders in America that were channeling money to anti-global protesters because the, even the the rich found the idea of the super super rich. Uh, not that they were against it, just they thought this is unsustainable and if people start to question the existence of these super rich people, it's going to spoil the party for the rest of us who are just slightly obscenely rich. Uh, and uh, so even, even people who are rich know that the idea of the super rich is, is um, you know, ba in the past super rich kept a low profile, but now we're in a world where there's a lot of scrutiny, a lot of social activity and social media that means that um, that the, the, these people who rather not have you talk about them, you can hold up a microscope to them. So um, it, it's um, it, it's and it, it provokes uh, strong feelings in people, and, and rightly so, because uh, these issues aren't going anywhere. You can, t I mean, the, you know, <coughs> I think commerce and, and vested interests will try to, if you like, uh, 
dampen down certain kinds of conversation or they'll put stuff out on social media to try and uh, counteract it or throw, throw curve balls or throw a wrench into things to try and divert the argument or make it more complex or, or you know how they do where they're, they're very, they're these nefarious means they have to not, not, not so much um, counter an argument, just, just disrupt the people who are having the argument so they start arguing amongst themselves. That's what Putin does, isn't it? Very good, is it? <laughs> What's your um, message to someone who uses these fast fashion chains? Because obviously their success is because of their popularity. There's a lot of people who use yeah, them. Yeah. And I mean, I don't expect, look, I don't expect, and you, I know what people, you could easily say, it's, like, it's all right for you, you're privileged, you can make choices like that. People want to buy cheap clothes. Um, I, I, uh, I don't blame people for wanting to buy, buy cheap clothes, of course, uh, but, but um, you know, it's, uh, you know, if things, it takes a long time for these things to change. You can't just say, stop doing this. But what you can do is start a discussion where people think, well, maybe, uh, you know, instead of uh, buying 10 pairs of jeans for, uh, you know, uh, for 10 quid each, uh, you, you probably buy one pair of jeans that's maybe a little bit more expensive. You make it last longer and it becomes, if something becomes uh, uh, has a sort of becomes a social taboo, the same way that if you are, you know, if you chuck litter, it, it's it's socially unacceptable, isn't it? If you do that, and and and, and it's getting to the stage now that if you are if you don't recycle or even attempt to recycle, that's also socially ir irresponsible. Uh, I mean, this is in metropolitan circles, but you, you have to start somewhere. Um, uh, whereas, and, and, and I see no reason why, you know, I'm saying prejudicial, homophobic things are no, no, not acceptable. And, and, you know, these things have emerged uh, over years through social change and through discussion, through public discussion. And I don't see any reason why um, high street cheap fashion, uh, if it became an issue, then, then attitudes do, do shift. It just takes a while. You have to start a discussion and provoke a discussion about it. Asa Butterfield, who plays? Finn in the film, he's a, a bright, bright future ahead of him. I oh think. yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful actor. Yeah, yeah. What's he like to work with? Uh, great. He sort of vanishes into the character, but he's uh, he's very, very watchable. I think uh, there's something about him that's uh, um, uh, compelling. Uh, yeah, even when he's not talking, your eyes drawn to him. Um, I'm quite sort of envious of that. I have to talk and make a noise for people to. Uh, uh, pay attention to me, but he has sort of inbuilt charisma. Yeah, we were lucky to get him. Really. Um, uh, but yeah, he's um, he definitely has that uh, enigmatic uh, quality that makes you know that there's, there's stuff going on beneath the surface, and he's not just a pretty face. <laughs> the you know we've been talking about politics here. You're very vocal about politics, and I think something that you're also quite fond of. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is the BBC. Yeah, yeah. The mm. BBC's been getting some stick recently for its current affairs reporting, and I wonder if you think any of that criticism is fair. Um, I think it is fair to hold them to make the BBC accountable. I sometimes get frustrated when I think, why are they giving that guy a hard time and giving this politician, a, a, I think, an easy time? Why aren't they asking the questions I think are important? I, I could, I could level lots of criticisms at the BBC, and a lot of criticism might be legitimate, but there's a there's a bigger picture, and uh, uh, about the BBC. And uh, I, don't, I think um, Gary Lineker's suggestion about making a BBC licence uh, fee uh, optional is a terrible idea. Um, uh, you know, the BBC is, I think, you know, second only to the NHS in its cultural importance to this country. And uh, about it's, a, it's something which is, it has a unique status. And although its status may have to adapt, um, it, it, you know, it, I would man the barricades to defend it because it's sort of part of our national identity. And if you look at the great programmes uh, that are made by the BBC, they are internationally respected throughout the world. You only have to look at a nature programme made by the Discovery Channel or any of the cable channels and compare it to the BBC and it just looks Mickey Mouse. In, by comparison, and that's because the BBC ha are not aren't driven by the bottom line. They can strive for excellence and not be concerned solely with uh, audience figures or satisfying shareholders. Because when you have that, when you have that sort of Murdoch approach to television, um, you end up with uh, you know the, the 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 end result of of complete deregulation and uh, and and not having. Um, 
uh, not state ownership, but it's the, it's the British people who effectively own the BBC. Um, if you go down that route, you, you end up with Fox News. And anyone who wants that is deranged. <laughs> How long, do you, well, do you think the, the licence fee is long of this world? Do you think it will hang around? Uh, I think it needs to exist in some form, some form. It's a kind of social taxation. It's like national insurance for the NHS, you know. If you want excellence um, and you don't want your every waking hour with adverts shoved down your throat, then you need to preserve the BBC. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope more people come out of the closet and say that, you know, if they want to, you know, uh, that they'll have a fight on their hands if they want to, to threaten it, um, yeah. Speaking of the BBC, I mean, your career is, there's been so much you've done. Just recently, the trip is huge. You've played Stan Laurel. But I'd like to ask you about singing Come Out You Black and Tans on the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was number one in the UK and Ireland over Christmas. And I wonder what the process of doing something like that is, because it's, it's quite, I want to call it counterculture but it's well, a bold it's, thing to do. It's not, you know, it's like, um, it's partly to do with uh, the, it, it, it is countercultural in some ways. It's, I mean, someone said that, 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 that the, the Wolf Tones are sort of banned from RTE in Ireland, Irish television, and I managed to do some, anyway, but, but I mean, partly it was to do with, um, you know, uh, the whole Irish-British history, and I'm, uh, I, I did my DNA test that I'm 95% Irish, so, uh, uh, even though I was born here, um, and uh, I feel I feel British and I feel Irish, and uh, you know, um, and the, I am I am proud to be a, a British, and I'm proud to have Irish roots too. I'm proud of both those things for different reasons. Not I'm not a flag waver, or uh, last night at the proms in those plastic Union Jack hats. I can't stand those people. But I am proud to be British for very very different reasons, which is our our history and culture of dissent, and uh, not accepting. Uh, the official line. Uh, we've got very good bullshit detectors, the British, and that's something to be proud of. But having said that, um, we did uh, stitch up the Irish for several hundred years, and so uh, uh, it was quite nice just to sort of like, I don't know, just um, uh, try and sort of. <laughs> I think partly it was uh, it was sort of a joke that I, I was doing the. I didn't want to do an Irish character who was just who was ridiculed. I wanted to do an Irish character who was ridiculing the sort of the establishment, if you like, the British establishment. And uh, and um, Alan sort of is the the worst side of the British establishment. Sort of all the pomposity of the British and none of the intelligence. Um, and uh, it was fun to get. Uh, a rebel song on BBC. Partly as a challenge, like, I wonder if we can get away with this. I mean, there's complete artistic justification for it, but there is part of it. Sometimes when we do parties, we often think, I wonder how many times you can see, say this word and over and over again, like with the Dan, Dan, Dan thing. Like, how many? And then we did a sex scene in one series where we thought, let's try and make the screen almost completely black so that there's no picture whatsoever and just have dialogue and see how long people will look at their TV screens if there's no picture. Uh, so sometimes we, got, like, we throw little challenges out for ourselves. So I think with that, it was like, it'd be funny if you sang some Irish rebel songs. Because, it, because of course, uh, you know, Alan Partridge is appalled, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, you went into detail there about what makes you proud to be British. I wonder if you could elucidate a bit more on what makes you proud to be Irish. What parts of your Irish heritage are you most proud of? Um, the film Philomena uh, is sort of my examination of that culturally because uh, the, there's a sort of, uh, uh, nobility and uh, a, a kind of a, a simplicity and a an, uh, working class eloquence, so certainly most of the working class Irish, uh, which is very expressive and passionate. And uh, uh, because of years of repression and I I its cultural history, uh, it, uh, there's, there's something really, um, uh, there's a sort of, uh, a, a voice, the Irish, which has in some ways thrived because of uh, sort of repression over the years. Um, and uh, I, I, I find that the, um, there's a, 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 a kindness and uh, an honesty uh, about them that I, I've sort of feel, you know, I spent all my summers there growing up. And something that feels, I just feel it in my bones, really. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so so it's it's sort of in my DNA. So I can't really express it more than that.
<laughs> uh, last question. You touched on Alan there. I wonder if you've ever ended up hating that character. Um, well, I, I stopped doing it for a few years, and uh, um, it's I sort of I stopped doing it because I thought, oh well, I've d I've done this now, and I d now now what do I do? You know, it, it's sort of I d won a bunch of awards about twenty years ago, and I thought well, I went to try to do some other stuff. And it, it sort of with varying degrees of success, and um, but then uh, it's then I started writing dramas and it started do doing okay, and and now I've got this sort of other career where I write serious stuff as well as doing my comedy. And um, when I when I sort of managed to get m make drama work and work more as an actor, doing more interesting things, I was more likely to come back to Alan. But th there was a period where I thought, oh God, it's like no one. I, I had to make my own work. You know, uh, if I was going to change this, I had to do it myself because no one else would offer me a job. No one would offer me a job as an actor because they thought just see Alan Partridge, they don't give me. It. So I had to sort of try and create opportunities for myself in that regard. Um, but I do love the character. I mean, it makes me laugh. I do actually. Uh, I'll send a text. I make notes on my phone, thinking what Alan would say about this. And uh, you know, I t I, we're just on a podcast, and I, I, I wrote to the guys saying we should do adverts in the podcast with Alan, saying trying to advertise local things and. In a really crass way, and so so I, I and and um and when they my, when Robin Neal send me scripts, I and I read them on the train and I laugh out loud because because they're funny. And, I, and when I do them, I'm not laughing because I'm being Alan. I can't. Alan doesn't find it funny. But when I read it beforehand, I laugh like the audience laughs at home. I think it's really funny stuff. It, it, it's so I enjoy doing it. Um, but there's definitely was a period where I was a bit. Uh, Reticent about uh, about him. It's a bit of an albatross. But then now I'm like, it's fine. It's like um, uh, as long as I can do that, I'll keep coming back to Alan. So um, I never now I, I would hate to sort of never do him. So I'll probably do him in some form or other till I die. <laughs> Wonderful, Steve Coogan. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>